Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this program. My name is Karen Tucker. I'm CEO at the Churchill Club, and this new world of energy discussion is called Carbon Management Challenges and Opportunities. We have a very diverse and distinguished group of people here to weigh in on this important topic. We have Roger Ains from Lawrence Livermore uh, National Laboratories. Sally Benson was not able to join us this evening um, on account of her voice leaving <laughs> for the day. I'm Sally Benson. And this is uh, the new Sally, Harun Majumdar. Uh, and then we also have Kendra Kuhl from Opus 12 and Sonia Vial from Shell. And George Paredes is here to lead them in conversation, but George is also a subject matter expert himself, so we have asked him to please also weigh into the discussion. Um, we wish to extend special thanks actually to Sally because she was the catalyst for this program and helped us to uh, frame it. And the, the speakers also weighed in, and we, we want to thank them as well as SRI for allowing us to use their conference center this evening. A uh, couple of words about Churchill Club. As an independent thought leadership <coughs> forum, we value civil discourse and trying to zero in on opportunities around areas that are very important, uh, specifically for innovation, for economic growth, and for social good. And we, uh, our purpose tonight is to explore the opportunities. Yes, we want to see where we are today, but we want to really focus as much as we can on what it means for tomorrow and what kind of conversation we might be having, depending on what happens between now and then, and say five years or so. Um, after the onstage conversation, George will then open up to a full room discussion, and we have many people in the audience who could easily be on the dais themselves, so we hope that you will raise your hand and um, ask to participate in the conversation from the audience. So with that, let me just turn it over to George and our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I have not quite joined Sally in having lost my voice, but as you can probably tell, I'm uh, not at my most mellifluous. I've been <laughs> battling with a similar prospect for the last few days, but I'll, I'll do my best uh, to facilitate uh, an exciting conversation tonight. We're very lucky to have a very distinguished and knowledgeable set of uh, panelists with us. We will leave ample time for questions at the end, so please make sure that you you join the, the discussion and uh, put us on the, on the spot. Before we begin, let me say a couple of words about what this is about and why we are here to begin with. Uh, I think it's clear that this is about climate change. And a very pertinent document was released just a few short weeks ago from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, the special report on one and a half degree warming stabilization. If you haven't read it, it comes with two shortened versions, the summary for policymakers and the, and the technical summary. I recommend that you at least look at one of those. It paints a fairly urgent, um, some, some may say disturbing, picture on what needs to happen. For quite some time now, the established wisdom was that we need to contain warming to about two degrees Celsius in order to avoid the worst environmental and social and other effects of of climate change. That wisdom is, uh, I think, has been pretty decisively overturned, and the report makes it clear that if, unless we try and limit warming to uh, an even lesser degree, so one and a half degrees Celsius, and that's our best guess right now in 2018, then we may be faced with consequences that uh, I think none of us would, would consider uh, acceptable or, or welcome. So we have a, a lot of work ahead. And this is the reason we, we're going to be talking about carbon management. If I can try and summarize for you the, the scale of the, of the challenge going forward, if you look at your handouts, there's a, there's a set of four graphs. Um, and this comes from the, from the IPCC report. And this is not meant to be a crystal ball, but it, it shows four possible pathways for how emissions could come down over the, the course of the, of the century in order to result in uh, a good likelihood of one and a half degree Celsius stabilization. And 
to me, the most striking feature of either of these four pathways is an extremely sharp kink um, starting in a very short amount of time. So if you look at the, the 2030 point, you will see that emissions start to drop very dramatically. And what this boils down to in, in a couple of sentences is that we have about a, a decade, and that decade is about to begin in uh, just over a year, so the 2020 to 2030 period. And over that time frame, global emissions from uh, energy use and from industrial processes need to be reduced by 53%. And in terms of the uh, the carbon, natural carbon sinks when, and land use change. Currently, it's a, it's a net emitter of about four and a half gigatons. It needs to be turned around. It needs to be turned around and change sign and become a, uh, a net sequesterer of, uh, of greenhouse gases, CO2 equivalent of 0.3 gigatons. So this is a this is a daunting prospect, and this is where carbon management comes in as a subject. So I think we, we know that there are many technical solutions to us, uh, available to us today in order to mitigate climate change. Uh, there's a, uh, an abundance of analyses that say that you know, we, we do not need technically to discover new technologies in order to, to avoid the worst effects of climate change. But that does not count uh, inertia in the political system, uh, human nature, and what may happen between now and, and 2030. So technically, it's, it's possible, uh, but we still face quite a challenge in making that happen. So with that as a, as a context, I will let the panelists uh, introduce themselves in turn, starting with, with Roger from my left. So please say a couple of words about who you are and what made you look into carbon management. and. Uh, why do you think we're even here to talk about it? Why is it important, if it is? Thank you, George. I'm Rod Rains. I'm the chief scientist of the energy program at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And we've worked on the subject of keeping carbon out of the atmosphere from our energy and industrial system for 20 years. And today, we're pretty convinced that the technology to do that exists. As George stated, it's really a matter of political will. And we're very focused on the remaining problem that even after we remove all the carbon from our energy system, we still have too much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So we're trying to figure out how we can actually remediate the atmosphere. Hi, I'm Sonia Vial from Shell. I've spent the better part of the last 10 years working in carbon management within Shell. First, I was working with assets and projects to reduce uh, their, their CO2 emissions. And then I was working on developing new processes uh, for our biofuels. And now I'm leading a group of researchers who are looking at really new technologies. I know you say that they, they, we don't need new technologies, but there are some exciting advances in technologies that are really opportunities. Oh, I'm assuming you're going to succeed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I am Kendra Kuhl, uh, Chief Technology Officer of Opus 12. Um, so I started working on CO2 actually as a grad student at Stanford University during my PhD research looking at catalysts that can convert carbon dioxide back into useful carbon-based compounds. Um, we learned a lot of fundamental science about the catalysis and then co-founded Opus 12 in order to take what we learned and apply it to make an actually industrially relevant process that can actually utilize CO2 and recycle it back into useful compounds. Hi, my name is Arun Majunda. I'm the co-director of the Precourt Institute for Energy at Stanford University. Um, I'm substituting for Sally Benson, who is really the expert in carbon management. But um, <laughs> I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Ains up there, <laughs> writing a report on direct air capture. That was, uh, we'll give away our age yeah. now. <laughs> um, but this was about a decade ago. Um, and then we have been involved at Stanford for a long time in um, carbon-related things, carbon capture, sequestration. We just had an amazing uh, forum called the Global Energy Forum that ended last week, Thursday and Friday, 
where this was the key takeaway, that just to give you some numbers, if you are to keep, you mentioned 1.5, I think 1.5 is kind of baked in at this point. And the question is, can we keep it below two? And I think we, the scientists can talk about two degrees, and people who are non-technical will say, oh, what the heck, it's two degrees. But it's not the global average temperature rise. It is the tail of the distribution for which the average is two. And the tail is four to five times the standard deviation that the tail is a very scientific word for it, is the tail wagging the dog. <laughs> and that tail has a disproportionate effect on our lives, and that's very, very disruptive in terms of heat waves, extreme temperatures, and in terms of our health, livestock, agriculture, droughts, those are the extremes that really get you. And if you are at, today we are just about one degree and the tails are already wagging. Now at two degrees, we are, in, we are as Steve Chu likes to point out, in the most physics terms, we are in deep doo-doo. So that's the, that's the situation we have. And if you are to keep the temperatures below two degrees, we have a budget today of about 800 gigatons of CO2. Okay, just remember the number, 800 gigatons, roughly. We are emitting at about 40 gigatons per year, roughly. If you keep our emission rate constant, which is not, it's increasing, but global emissions rate, if it's constant 40 gigatons and you've got 800 gigatons left, you've got 20 years left. After 20 years, it has to be zero. It's not gonna happen though, right? So we need some serious, serious effort in global carbon management to be able to manage this below two degrees. I would love to keep it below one degrees, but to me it seems that that's already baked in. So some, some great points being made, being made there. Let, uh, let's spend a little bit of time discussing them in more detail. First of all, you say that's not gonna happen. Could you please elaborate on that? I think well, I mean, there's... the way I look at it is that if you look at the development that is going on in, let's say, China and India, okay? And that development is, um, you know, you need to make steel concrete and construction and you need energy to drive your economy. Unless there's a dramatic change in the next few years, because anything that you know, in the energy system, 20 years is not that long a time. So if you are to make some dramatic changes in the next five years, I can see that, well, there's a hope. But if you are not to change that, okay, and if you don't keep our promises that people, that countries made in Paris, then we got to do, so find some other alternatives as well. Whether it's negative emissions, which I think all these curves are saying that you need negative emissions. We have to figure out how to do that uh, today, it seems like plants may be one of the few possible ways to do it, uh, photosynthetic process, but today we absorb about 120 gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere, right, by through photo carbon, not CO2. 440 tons, gigatons of CO2, and we keep about two or three percent down in the soil and let everything back again. We gotta change that. Okay, so those are the kinds of things, other options that we need to figure out to be able to manage that because if you are to maintain the development in the way we are doing it now, um, that's not gonna be enough to decarbonize that part. So the, as an interesting follow-up question here, which um, coming from the environmental NGO community we encounter fairly often, um, is there an inherent competition and between negative emissions technologies or carbon management and the, the pillars of climate mitigation as we've come to know them to date, to date, which are increasing energy efficiency, increasing fuel economy, making cleaner fuels, um, renewable energy. So is there, a, is there an inherent conflict, or do you think that they're complementary? And is there a, a risk calculus involved in deciding whether and how much to, to invest in carbon management? I think one of the problems we've had in the United States is that we've been so focused on our electricity sector, so focused on our coal plants. They are the biggest emitters. They were the biggest emitters. They aren't today. Uh, 
we were so focused on that that we ignored all these other problems. We ignored California's cars. Half of our emissions in California are either from our cars or from the production of petroleum that goes in our cars. And we've been doing great on electricity. Cars are still going up. And so this, this blindness to the whole problem has really, I think, put us in a position where we need to think about different kinds of answers. Just to add on to that, I mean, I think the scope, the the enormity of the, of the issue lends itself that all solutions are welcome. So I, I don't really see a competition between the, the things that you mentioned. They, all of these things are part of the solution. Yeah, and I think thinking about renewable electricity, um, <clears throat> the emphasis that's been placed on that has really brought down the cost of renewables. And that actually enables some of these other carbon management solutions like, along the lines of like what we're doing with carbon utilization, um, you know, carbon dioxide, very low energy, you have to react it with something else or add some energy into the system in order to recycle it. And so as other energy costs come down, then that provides you a source of energy to enable that cycle. That's a really important point. When you fly over those windmills in Oklahoma and you're flying back east, look down on those, they're selling electricity and making a profit they're selling it for less than two cents a kilowatt hour. That's free. <laughs> and every one of you in your pocket has a cell phone. It's an example of what happens when a really important product becomes really cheap. You don't spend less money on it, you buy more of it. <laughs> and we're gonna use electricity to solve the problems that we have today because it's becoming cheap and hopefully carbon free. I would just go back to what Roger said earlier. I think it is absolutely critical. It's, it's all hands on deck right now. And it's important to decarbonize electricity system with solar, wind, hopefully cheap nuclear at some point. Um, it is important to electrify the transportation sector with that clean electricity. Um, all of that is necessary, but that's not sufficient. If you only focus on the electricity sector, we will be missing the point because if you look around the world, 80% of our primary energy, 80% of our primary energy is fossil based. Okay, and part of it goes into transportation, part of it goes into industrial heat, which is extremely difficult to decarbonize. This is in the steel sector, concrete sector, petrochemical, our food and agriculture. If food and agriculture were a, were a country, it would be number three, next to China, India, and then food. Okay, so we have to decarbonize that, and we need to figure out how to turn CO2 from a liability to an asset with cheap carbon-free electricity. And you need all of that to be able to you know, get this within the budget of 800 gigatons of CO2. And so this is not either or, and we will be faced with the tyranny of either or, as opposed to and. And I think this is the time to look at and right now. And just to add on to that point, I agree with you 100%, so, so those, are, those are really challenging. And then on top of that, people will need more energy. That's right. The population is growing. The economies are growing in the emerging economies. Economic right. growth is yeah. hand in hand with energy. That's right. And so, so we, on top of needing to uh, deal with our emissions today, we have the growth that we also That's have right. to That's right. So to it's, deal it's with. really a triple whammy, if I could say that. The population is going to grow from 7.5 billion people to about 9 billion or 9.5 billion by the middle of this century. And the economies are growing some places at 6, 7. India is at about 8% right now. So the per capita GDP is going up, which means they'll be buying more air conditioners, more all of that. Mm -hmm. By the way, air conditioners are pretty bad yeah. because of the refrigerants. Again, they have to, so the demand for cooling is going up, and our refrigerants will be phased out. We have, this is a dilemma. And so how do we do that? So all of this. Is, is all mixed together. I don't know whether it's triple, quadruple, some whammy, N, N. So let's, let's spend a minute here and try and define what exactly we're talking about. So what does carbon management look like today? What kinds of methods or technologies are we talking about? And then in a minute, we'll touch about on how that might look like in, in the future. But if, you know, let's, let's make it clear to the audience what's, what we have in mind. Who wants to? I think you have varied perspectives on this, mm -hmm. so let's let's hear from all of you. Well, for starters, we took 
uh, take today. Uh, stored energy that was stored, you know, three or four hundred million years ago, and we burn it to recover it. And that is carbon. It's all carbon. And so we have to figure out either how to do that without emitting the carbon back into the atmosphere, which is technologically perfectly feasible, um, or we need to figure out how to do without that energy. Um, this is something I'm very pleased Shell is, is in, involved in that conversation of how do we, how do we solve those two dilemmas. Uh, but, but the issue is that we have all this stored solar power that we're now burning and emitting the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere at a rate thousands of times faster than we actually put it underground to begin with. So that's unsustainable, clearly. Uh, the second thing that I worry about is the carpet under your feet. This is a carbon-based economy. We, this carpet is made out of petroleum. Lots of things in our world are made out of petroleum. Our food system is made out of carbon. We're not getting away from carbon. We can't say we're going to have a carbon-free existence. We have to figure out how to have the carbon in our lives that doesn't end up turning into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. At Shell, we're looking at carbon management or decarbonization across all of our uh, assets. We're looking at scope one emissions, which are the emissions that we emit from the existing operations. And uh, those technologies are energy efficiency, co-generation, uh, looking at what exactly are we emitting uh, in methane and how to reduce flaring. So we're looking at all kinds of different technologies for existing assets. We're looking at scope two emissions, which is the emissions that are due to the power that's used at our facilities. We're trying to bring more renewables into the mix. <coughs> and then when you think about scope three, and that's the emissions from the internal combustion engine, so our, our consumers. And we're also looking at CCS. We have a CCS facility in Alberta. It sequesters a million tons of CO2 every year. And that's carbon capture and sequestration yes. for those of you who <laughs> did not live in this, in this world. <coughs> Kendra? Uh, yeah, to kind of build on Roger's point, I mean, I think carbon has kind of gotten a bad name, but it's actually really ubiquitous and we need it to function in today's world. So many of our products rely on it. And so it's really about finding a way, you know, how can we use those same products but not add CO2 to the air? Because um, <coughs> we've there's all this development that's been done to give us these very advanced materials, and I think we want to continue to take advantage of that, but without all the negative consequences. So the question that you asked is something that the previous Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, asked a few of us in his advisory group about six months before the end of the term. He, I wish he had asked about a year and given <laughs> us a year to write the report, but let me tell you what we came up with in terms of what kind of R, D, and D we should be doing to address this precise question. And I'll give you sort of the highlights of that. Um, and if you are ever suffering from insomnia, there's an 80-page <laughs> report you can read. Number one, as I was saying, the biological, the natural cycle of carbon that goes um, you know, it, uh, goes around the Earth, is about, as I said, 120 gigatons of carbon. And we keep only two gigatons in the soil. And rest of it goes back again. And if you are to do something at the gigaton scale, and frankly, we have a gigaton scale problem, we need gigaton scale solutions. Megatons is not going to do it. This is one cycle that is going at the gigaton scale. And the question we asked is that could we use our modern gene editing tools for crops, for example, that we grow on an annual basis to provide more food and at the same time have deeper roots. Why deeper roots? Because the decay of carbon in the soil goes down exponentially as you go deeper. So if you can somehow come up with plants and crops that have deeper roots, it will reduce the CO2 decay, which will put it back in the atmosphere. And you only need a few percent to get to a gigaton scale. Okay? So this is a, you know, we haven't quite done that, but we know if we could do it, this will make a big difference. So that's number one. Number two is what Kendra is working on. 
could we turn CO2 into something useful, but it, it, something useful, it'll be only useful when it's cost competitive. Mm -hmm. And one of the boundary conditions of that is that the cost of energy has to be below three cents a kilowatt hour. Otherwise, it will not be cost competitive. The cost of energy will dominate everything. Right now, we have, with wind and solar, for the first time in history, that we have renewable energy, carbon-free energy, at scale anywhere in the world at that cost on below. And it's going down. So this is a very significant opportunity to turn CO2 into something. And one of the ingredients, one of the precursors for that is hydrogen. So if you can split water and produce hydrogen, then you can take CO2 and do things with it, or as Kendra is trying, go directly to you turn CO2 into something. So hydrogen, not so much for transportation mobility, maybe, but hydrogen to decarbonize the carbon-based economy and turn CO2 mm -hmm. into something, big deal. So that's something that we should be looking at carefully. Carbon capture. So how do you capture carbon dioxide from a dilute source and at very low cost? Today, if you try to capture carbon dioxide from a coal-fired power plant, and it'll cost you about, what, $60? Roger, you meant, right? Yeah. $60 yeah. a ton. Can we reduce it down to about $20, $30 a ton? And that requires chemistry and chemical engineering because we don't have the sorbents, the things that bind on to CO2 and pull it out. And we don't have good binders, and they get, they get polluted by water vapor and all kinds of things. The other thing that CO2 is used for is to, today, the oil and gas industry uses CO2, pushes it down into the oil fields, and gets more oil out. And they try to reuse the, uh, the CO2, which is called enhanced oil recovery. <coughs> and what we try to do today is to push as little CO2 as possible and get as many hydrocarbons out. The question is, can you push CO2 down and do get hydrocarbons out, but with a net positive CO2 storage? And those kinds of things have not been completely worked out. And finally, with all of this, you need a price in carbon. Otherwise, why would anyone put CO2 down below and either keep it there or get something out of it? You need a price in carbon. And that's, so you put all that together, and you need a large workforce. You need lots of money to be able to, funding to be able to do that. That's what would be, what global carbon management would be about. So. A clarifying question here before we finish on what does carbon management look like today and we attempt to take a stab at the vision for the, for the future here. There are some techniques that are inherently technology-based and there are others which are um, more biology-based. And there's, there's a gray area in between and I think some of the companies that we may have represented here today may be shining examples of that. But um, I think there's a, there's a definite difference between a family of, of methods and technique that involve afforestation, reforestation, uh, the so-called BEX bioenergy with mm -hmm. carbon capture and storage, and on the other hand, uh, more technologically based methods that attempt to recycle CO2 or turn it into, into products. Um, the, the, the former family of, of techniques seems to be wrought with um, a whole range of ecological and carbon accounting and carbon, actual carbon footprint problem. So would you like to take a stab at answering the relative weight that should be placed between the, the two families? Well, the, the first thing that always needs to be said in a calculation like this is first we have to stop emitting carbon from fossil fuels. And there, you know, even though there might be an overlap between these two activities, that has to be the, the primary thing that we're putting our, our focus on today. And we can stop emitting those by having adequate carbon management. We can stop emitting them by replacing them with renewables. Um, I think beyond that, it becomes exactly as Kendra said, an, an all of the above situation. Um, growing more forests is a very popular topic today. I think it's terrific. You'll go to Maine or go to Connecticut for that matter and you're going to see it works. Um, uh, on the other hand, we don't want to take farmland out of production to grow more forests. And so one of the things that I'm very interested in is the fact that our farmland, as Arun mentioned, 
We've lost, uh, I'll use the same units that Arun did, units of carbon, not carbon dioxide. We've lost 133 billion tons of carbon from agricultural soils around the world through bad practice. If we replaced those today, if we could do it tomorrow, we wouldn't have a problem. We'd be done. <laughs> now, we know we can't do it tomorrow, but the question is, how fast could we do it? That, that kind of thing really needs to be resolved. I think we all agree. <laughs> In violent agreement, which is kind of scary. Yeah. It sounds like it. And there's a, there's a whole new interesting family of, uh, of technologies that actually use biological methods in order to do uh, certain things with, with CO2. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. By what the way, we're trying to increase countries. the photosynthetic efficiency of what is called the Calvin Benson cycle. Try to increase that efficiency without using more water or fertilizer is a big deal. Because a photosynthesis, by the way, is extremely inefficient. Mm -hmm. the, the, the efficiency of going from the number of photons to chemical bonds is less than 1%. The debate is whether it's 0.1 or 0.2. It's less than one. OK, so the question is, can we use our best scientific knowledge to increase the photosynthetic efficiency without increasing water use or fertilizer use? Because if you can do that, it's not only good for carbon absorption, it's good for growing more food. And with increasing population and increasing prosperity, we'll, no grow, we'll, we'll need more food. By the way, meat, beef. <laughs> not, please don't stop eating steaks and all that. That's, that's fine. But I'm really excited about this impossible burger. Yeah. <laughs> right? And that, you know why it tastes like meat? Is because they have been able to artificially make the compound heme, which is the key part of hemoglobin. And that, that's the taste of blood. Okay, and they've been artificially be able to make it and insert it in that, which is why it tastes so great. <laughs> and so, I mean, but I think the innovations in terms of on the food and agriculture, plenty that need to be done. I want to mention something else that we're doing here in California that we should all pat ourselves on the back for, with. We have something here called the low carbon fuel standard. It, every year it tries to decrease the carbon obligation that comes from the fuel that we put in our cars and trucks, and now even airplanes. Um, and it's an extremely efficient system. For instance, we can re decrease it by making biofuel. We can make biofuel from, we make it, most of it from corn today. California has made that a much more efficient process. It's no longer an embarrassingly in inefficient process. Um, but we could make that from a lot of other things. We could make it from the 2 million tons of almond waste that we have a year. We could make it from the 9 million tons of forest waste that we have a year. And in doing so, also catch the carbon dioxide. Turns out when you make biofuel, for every molecule that ends up in the tank of your car, another molecule goes up in the air, it's CO2. It's just the way the chemistry turns out to be. If we could catch that, we could have a double win. We could make biofuel, make our, our cars that we drive today much more uh, carbon, much less carbon uh, emitting, and take some carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And that's all set up in the California low carbon fuel standard. And it's a thing that's going to happen in the future here. And so you know, it's not all gloom and doom. We have some amazing mechanisms that are in play, and we're going to try them out here in California. So I hear you pretty optimistic about the, the promise of this suite of, of technologies and, and techniques, but what does it amount to today? How, um, if, if we were to express it in uh, a ton of CO2 equivalent scale, are we talking about megatons, gigatons, thousands of tons? How, how real is it right now? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let them think about it that for a minute. Um, to date, this low carbon fuel standard that we have in California has avoided on the order of 12 million tons of emissions, um, that's a drop in the bucket compared to the 400 some odd million tons of emissions that we have per year in California. But it's a start. And it's extremely important to start. We can't sit here and say, oh, we don't have the perfect system. We won't do anything yet. We need to get started. And we have a start. Yeah, I guess I can speak to CO2 utilization. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a field that is in some ways in its infancy right now, um, <clears throat> whereas carbon capture and sequestration is more developed um, and could be applied more readily today. But there's been, it's been difficult because that's just, just cost money. 
right? And so no one wants to put a carbon capture and a sequestration um, onto their existing CO2 emission source. Whereas the CO2 utilization has the promise of turning the CO2 into something that could be profitable and can motivate potentially building some of those carbon capture facilities, um, at least making it kind of cost neutral or a little bit of profit out of it. Um, and so I think that's where these newer technologies might help us bridge the gap and, and make it a little bit easier to adopt some of these more readily established or already developed technologies. When I think about Shell's ambition in reducing their net carbon footprint, they express that in uh, tons of CO2 per megajoule. So it's, it's a, an, an intensity ambition. Uh, and again, that the whole suite of carbon management technologies is critically important that we, that we, inst that we uh, develop those and that we uh, deploy those to reduce our intensity. The way I look at it is, again, these are all, I mean, all of the things that are being discussed, these are all important, but I go back to we have a gigaton scale problem. And if you ask the question, how many industries are there today that are at the gigaton scale, that have the same scale today, there are only six of them. It's oil, gas, steel, concrete, coal, agriculture. Is that five or six? Did I say five? Something like that. I lost it. So I think the oil and gas industry and, and Shell and many others are taking the lead on this are have this historic opportunity because they're already at scale mm -hmm. to be able to become the best stewards of carbon, broadly speaking. Right? And there are many technologies, efficiency being the first step, and then there will be at scale carbon capture and utilization, et cetera. And so, and also, I know that Shell is now looking at other opportunities, electrification or transportation. They, you guys have a trading arm in electricity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Shell is, and many of the oil and gas companies are trying to broaden themselves to become energy service companies, as they say. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, also become the carbon stewards company. Because as soon as there's a price on carbon, which they, frankly, if there is no price on carbon, it's game over. Okay. So if there is a price on carbon, there is a business incentive. And oil and gas companies are already at scale. And they have this historic opportunity to provide the stewardship. So I think those are, and I, today, without a price on carbon, people are trying out new things, as they should. Some of these experiments will fail. But you, you know, we'll have to f learn quickly and move on and talk to each other so that we don't repeat other people's mistakes. So this is the time to prepare for the eventual, it has to be, with some price on carbon, and thereby then scale up as quickly as possible. The investment by industry and government today is crucial. When I first came to Livermore 34 years ago, we had these little windmills up in the Altamont Pass above my office. They were clattering little tinker toys, 50 kilowatt machines. They made money because they were heavily subsidized. The companies that put them up there made money. The people took a paycheck home. All those companies are gone. All those windmills are gone. But the learning is still here. And when we put up windmills in the Altamont today, they're these three megawatt monsters that make money the day you put them up. And that's exactly where we need to be today. We're not there. We don't have a scale issue yet, but we need to create the businesses. And we are creating the businesses that do that. And that's what's going to get us to success. The US coal industry failed to adopt carbon capture 15 years ago when it became clear it was feasible. And as a result, they're going out of business today. Um, I probably have other factors involved in there, too. But uh, the, you know. Natural gas. <laughs> right, shale gas. switch to natural gas. Yeah. The shale yeah. gas, the yeah. cheap. Uh, but you, know, you can't just say, we're going we're gonna to wait for the perfect answer. We have to start now. So your answers make me both happy and, and nervous. Uh, as someone who works for a, uh, an environmental NGO and spends the bulk of his time in, in advocacy, I've seen that there are certain impediments to getting things done quickly. And we know that we have a suite of tools available under the umbrella of carbon management that's currently at the, at the megaton. 
scale, and we know that we need to shift this up by several orders of magnitude to the gigaton scale. And I think I can say confidently in front of this audience that if we just wait for it to happen, it won't. Someone needs to take action, and in fact, many actors need to take action. And we need to have a, a coordinated and well thought out plan in order to get from, from A to B. So I would like to hear from you. Do you think that we have such a plan in mind? Who, who do you think should take the lead here? And what is the scale of investment that we should be looking at and by when? Because if you, if you look at the climate problem and the, the charts that we looked at a while ago, uh, we don't have the luxury of time. This stuff needs to happen quickly and we have a lot of ground to cover. Well, Shell is taking a lead in this area. We created a new energies business two years ago, and we have, uh, we have publicly announced we're gonna spend one to two billion dollars annually on new energy technologies. But we can't do this by ourselves. So this is exactly what you said. This is a collaboration. We, we have to see policy mechanisms. Uh, we have to understand consumer choice. Uh, consumers have to choose to, to also want to uh, address this problem, and th that's a very difficult challenge to, to get all of these factors collaborating and moving in the same direction. And we have to understand that there's no perfect choice. Uh, my friend George here has taught me that, that good policy is not the single best policy, but an overlapping bunch of really good policies. <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think that's the kind of thing we need to have here is there's no single good answer, but let's let a bunch of good answers work. I'm ecstatic at what Shell's doing. I'm ecstatic at what Kendra Cool's doing. You know, these are the kinds of things that are going to create options that you all can look at in the future and say, I, I back these things. I think the 40, 48Q? 48Q. Or is 45Q. 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 Um, 45Q is a, is a good start. Um, it pays you to do something with carbon. Um, and that's a good way to try out things at the, you know, megaton scale and to be able to, and so that you can, you can debug the system so that you can prepare for the gigaton scale. So that's, that's a good start. Um, there are other things that, um, that the government has done in terms of carbon sequestration and saline aquifers. There's been a lot of study on that. So all, those are all preparation again. Um, and I think absolutely a price in carbon will provide the business incentives. And without the business incentives, it's not gonna scale. So we need that too. But what we do in the United States is necessary, but not sufficient. We need China and India to step up to the plate and do some real serious carbon management as well. And especially because their, their economies are growing at a rate and the population in India is growing. And so if you look at that and if China and India don't step up, I mean, it's game over, frankly. And so I think that's the, it's an international issue and I know people get bogged down by this per capita carbon emissions. Yes, I mean, those are, those are legitimate things, but it's a global issue. There's only one Earth. And I think the lessons that we learned from here, if we could, you know, and there's all these issues about technology transfer, and given all of that, if we could figure out the lessons learned from the United States, if we could take the lead in a few things and let some of the other countries learn from it, and enable them to become the stewards of carbon globally, especially China and India, I think that would be the right path internationally. Yeah, and I think, speaking as someone who's developing a new technology to deal with these problems, um, there is more and more support to do that, both from the government, from private industry, and from you know, large companies. Uh, that are interested in, in adopting some of those innovations. Um, but I do worry that the scale, it's definitely more than it has ever been, but whether it's enough to hit you know, zero emissions in 10 or 20 years. That's hard. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure because you look at like oil and gas, that's, been a, that's technology that's been under development for 100 years. 
and how many billions of dollars have gone into that industry to make it as efficient as it is today. Um, so how long does it take to develop a new technology and how much money? And I think it is a little bit daunting um, when you look at that. And certainly we're, we're doing a lot more and kind of maybe the best that we can, but there's still a gap. That daunting economics, though, I want to address that head on. We know how much carbon we emit in the entire economy of the world. We know what, how, what the economy of the world is. It's something like $78 trillion. And if you take the, the amount of carbon that we emit and you say it's going to cost us $100 a ton to manage that carbon dioxide. I'm now, I'm sorry. Arun and I are using a little different units. I don't want to confuse you. $100 a ton for carbon dioxide. Today, that would be 5% of the world's economy. We can do this. It's a matter of will. It's a matter of having the technology available to do it. But $100 a ton is the median price that California estimates it's going to cost us to get to our carbon targets. That's a perfectly reasonable number, 5% of the global economy. We can do that. And for those of you who missed the, the recent publication of a National Academy's reports on negative emission technologies, the, you'll see that they itemize the technologies that they think are available today and, and methods, and they actually propose a suggested degree of investment over a five to 20 year window. My quick and dirty sums show that what they're actually proposing at this early stage sums up to about $14 billion over the next, uh, over the next five to 20 year um, window. And of course, we, we may have to reevaluate how much um, that's working and not working for us, but at least that's the, that's the opening estimate of what it would take to test certain assumptions, uh, to develop the governance for certain techniques, usually the ones that involved forests to understand, better understand um, technologies that are not so well understood today and to bring down the costs on technologies that have shown to have been demonstrated already at a smaller scale to, to be feasible, but would need to come down and cost significantly in order to contribute more meaningfully to the uh, to this gigaton scale challenge. So, okay, here we are. It's but can I just sure. address one of the points Roger made? Um, I think it's, yes, we, in, in principle, it's 5% of the global economy, and we can do it in principle. The question is, you really have to understand from an investor's point of view. Yep. There certainly needs to be a price in carbon, preferably a simple tax. And what George Schultz has been proposing is a revenue neutral carbon tax, which I think is the right way to do it because then you don't have a fiscal drag on the economy. But that's just the, the way to get some returns on carbon. But then you also need to provide the capital with a long-term view and low cost. And the cost of the capital will require some de-risking of the technology, which means we need to figure out how to evaluate the risk of these technologies. And you know, in the capital market, it's a competition between investments and returns over here with the investment returns on software. And so we have to provide the analysis and to show that the returns could be reasonable in the long term on the, on the investments that they make, which will then grab the 5% of the capital that will come into this versus something else. And so I think this, we, we have to look at it very holistically at some level. And then there are many layers below this that has to be figured out as well. And I'm not sure, you know, we, we, we haven't figured all those out yet. Really? <laughs> Maybe you have. No, no. Maybe no. Shell has. That sounded sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, I think that's absolutely right, and it's a, it's a much needed injection of, of reality here. I think that there's nothing that points to the lack of feasi feasibility in, in any of this, but that does not in any way diminish the, the hard work and the considered efforts that will need to be, to be made by all of us and, and many more in order to, to make this a reality. So we have about just under five minutes before we move to, to q and I'd like to, to invite our esteemed panelists here to share their own vision of the future. So we were 2018, 
you know, we're looking at very significant reductions by mid-century. If, if you had your way, how would you go about ensuring that the, the things we talked about today would become real? In no particular order. I think the most important thing we can do today is to create businesses that will do this job, make it profitable for Kendra and people like her to start these things. Because imagine that the models that you have in your, your handout there tell us we need to remove 10 billion tons a year of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in 2050. The global oil industry today is 2 billion tons of oil. We need to create industries in 22 years that are five times the size of a global oil industry. We have to start today. And so we need the things. And, and that's a good place to invest government money, is starting businesses. And Roger, is this a government undertaking only? Is this a, um, an imperative for the investment community? Who should? Absolutely. I, this? Yeah. I, and and I, I see a lot of companies, and, and frankly, some investors who take that attitude as well, that that's a pretty near term shift in business that it's worth investing in today. Uh, I lead a group of researchers, and they are doing amazing things to try to figure out technology solutions for this problem. I mean, we're looking at the next generation. What's the next generation of batteries? We're looking similarly to what Kendra is working on with Opus 12, and we work with Kendra on that, uh, on, on converting CO2 into something that, that is uh, a product. And um, to me, the future looks bright because we're, I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel, I feel very optimistic that we're going to have some technology solutions that can help us to get to the, the place that we need to be for decarbonization. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> we have to move away from taking carbon out of the ground in the form of petroleum or natural gas or coal that eventually ends up in the air. Um, and electrification is, is one way to do that. Um, electric cars. Um, solar, wind power, other sources of renewable power. Um, but I think we will still need these carbon-based compounds. Um, we still need fuels for airplanes, shipping, um, things like that, and, and just materials that are all around us. So in that very far future, um, if we can find alternative sources, and maybe it's biomass, maybe it's recycling CO2, um, there's lots of different carbon sources out there. But we need to find some alternative to this you know, underground carbon that we're using today. Uh, let me just add that I, I agree with all of that. But let me add a few things. One is that we, um, I hear sometimes people say, just throw money at it or make the policy and everything will happen. It doesn't work that way. We need new technology, new solutions. And you can't rely on the solutions that, is, that got us here in the first place. So R&D to create new solutions, whether it's Kendra or someone else. I know Shell is doing a lot internally. We are doing at Stanford and many other universities, whether it's Berkeley or, and the National Labs, et cetera. And this is not just in the United States. People are doing it globally. That R&D to create new solutions will be absolutely critical because we need new options. So that's number one. And then you need the finance, because throwing money at the wrong solution is, is not going to solve this problem. So that's one. I also think, as I said before, a price on carbon is critical to get this going. You need an innovation ecosystem, because Kendra needs other people to be able to work with, whether it's large companies, maybe it's competitors. Competition is not so bad in this case. Or other partners that you can, you know, partners will become Competitors will become partners in the future. So that ecosystem is critical to be done. I would also look at this from an international point of view. And I keep coming back because this is a global issue. And this global carbon management truly has to be global. It's not just us. It's other countries as well. And finally, I would add that the weights, and I, and I am schizophrenic in this. Sometimes I feel very optimistic. Sometimes said, oh my god, two degrees is not going to be, ain't going to happen. We're going to go across and we're looking at three or four degrees. And if that's the case, we have to look at adaptation because we cannot rely only on the mitigation side 
and hope for the best and, you know, and, and then prepare for the best. We can't hope for the best and prepare for the best, okay? Because that's not a good insurance policy. And I think you really have to look at adaptation, which means what happens in droughts, what happens in, in heavy rain that we just saw. This is going to get aggravated even more in the future. Fires, forest fires, that emitted carbon, a lot of carbon. And so I, I think we have to look at adaptation techniques so that we don't aggravate the problem in the future. So I think a combination of what was said and all the other things that I just talked about. Thank you very much. And a quick closing thought from me before we move to, to questions from, from you. And thank you for your patience. Uh, I'll refer you to the, the second chart that is here in your handouts. This shows the ozone depleting substance emissions. There's a great success story out there. It's called the Montreal Protocol. We discovered that some of the refrigerants that we were using were creating, uh, were depleting um, ozone, and that was causing problems. So the world got together. Uh, there was an immediate problem. Uh, the chemicals that were causing this, this damage were gradually phased out, and the, the trajectory of this, to me, seems very familiar um, to the graphs that the IPCC has been putting out. We're talking about a challenge of reducing emissions um, to by, by about two-thirds of the current levels in the space of two, two and a half decades. Now, there's a huge difference. This was a, a specialized um, subset of, of chemicals that had readily available substitutes, and the, the compelling nature of uh, a hole in the ozone layer, I think, really did motivate uh, the globe to act on this. Carbon is ubiquitous in our economy. It's not an easy problem to solve. It's much more embedded in, uh, in our economy. So it's, I think it's much uh, more of a, of a challenge. So I think we, we have some examples where we, humanity has demonstrated that they can grab the bull by the horns and do something about a problem that's imminent and, and daunting. But I think the, the carbon problem is, uh, again, an order of magnitude more challenging than the, than the, the ozone uh, layer. So that's both a challenge and hopefully a a reason for, for optimism. I hope that we all do our bit. Uh, I think governments and jurisdictions all around the world are going to be uh, called upon in the next few years to decide whether they do want to look seriously at um, these forms of carbon management alongside the, the traditional pillars of climate mitigation and whether the risk calculus drives them to do something about it or not. So thank you for bearing with us. Let's turn to questions from you. Um, I'm Joanne Tan. I'm the owner of 10 Plus Visual Branding. So I would like to address the elephant in the room nobody is talking about. Because given the short time frame the humanity has, and given how complicated and how diverse disciplines and collaborators have to work together toward one goal, and the global nature of this thing, I mean, you cannot imagine a private sector, no matter how powerful, how rich, uh, to to, to have China and India come together, have scientists come together, have all sectors of the economy come together, you cannot, it has to be the government. So that's the elephant I'm addressing. But given how close the, our midterm is, I mean, we're gonna lose time. We have to have the government working together because they can mobilize all those resources. But if, Donald Trump is going to be running another four years. What do you think we can do? Can private companies, can private sectors do something so we don't lose this precious window of time? Okay. So I don't think that any of us want to make any political statements uh, <laughs> during this, this forum. So let me rephrase the, the question ever so slightly. Uh, wh what do you think should be the mix between government action and private sector action in uh, bringing these technologies to the, to the fore of, of scalability. But I think your question is absolutely legitimate, though, that if you look at how Paris really happened, the year before that, US and China got together and made a, not a commitment, but a joint statement. And only when US and China, and I was part of the 
track two dialogue between U.S. and India. I was representing you in the United States. We were in India, New Delhi, when the announcement was made. And the Indians said, we want to be part of it. They, they don't want to be left behind. And it went to a big kind of, uh, so I think you're absolutely right that we need leadership between at least the top three or four or five emitters. Paris was fantastic, we were fantastic. We got how many, 190 countries altogether? Now, for adaptation, we do need 190 countries. Don't get me wrong, because those island nations, all they're in danger. But for mitigation, top 10 would do. Okay, because that's where the problem really is. So I think the leadership from the various nations in coming together and saying that we have this common goal, because of, you know the planet will survive. Don't get planet will is perfectly fine. It is humanity <laughs> that's at risk, and so I, I think it's in that interest that we need leadership absolutely. And I don't want to get political. I mean, this is just this is what we need to get the, to mobilize the scientific community, the financial community, the business community, the NGO community to get this going. You're absolutely right. I mean, at, at Shell, as a, a private company, we are already taking steps in, the, in this direction to decarbonize. Um, renewables are cheap, and so we're, we're looking at ways um, to use them in a good way, but unfortunately, renewables have intermittency. And so how do you uh, all use renewables in a good way? We have a lab at the Technology Center where I am working in Houston, and we're looking at solar PV in combination with batteries, in combination with natural gas generators, in combination with um, the loads that we need to supply to see how all of these things can work together. So th there are some near-term solutions that, that private industry can, can work on. Uh, but the, the scale of the problem requires a lot more intervention. And it requires us business, especially businesses here in California that are profitable and environmentally oriented, to say, I may not make a profit on this investment, but in the long run, it's going to be good for all of us. And I, I, you, you see companies doing this. Um, I think it needs to be on a much larger scale. I unfortunately think they're going to be more likely to act just like Shell spending a billion dollars on their own volition. They're more likely to act than governments, although I would love to see governments act. I'm not going to wait for it. Do we have a next question? Hi. Hi. Um, first, thank you um, for a great panel. Um, after a I'm not going to talk about politics, but after watching news for the past week, it's nice to see a, a collegial discussion with <laughs> <laughs> such, uh, such hopeful ending to the Montreal Protocol. So, so uh, good for you to uh, remind us that the world can come together and, and fix a daunting global problem. Um, so I'm Jeff Cohen. I have a, we have a company called Expansive. Um, and our aim is to differentiate commodities based on their environmental attributes. So we've created a technology platform that transforms data into basically an environmental commodity. So end users at, the glo at a global scale, like commodity consumers, can preferentially select for commodities that have been produced with low environmental impact. So your Opus 12 materials would get a premium on our platform. Uh, the, the biofuel or the uh, natural gas with a low methane leakage intensity would get a premium uh, by virtue of utility pl paying a little bit more for that gas through our platform. So we're, we're basically p enabling um, companies to put a price on carbon without government intervention, um, starting with the materials at the base of global supply chains. So sorry for that long comment. My question is, um, you mentioned 45Q, which is a tax credit for carbon sequestration in geologic formations. Have you guys thought about, I mean, you're sequestering carbon. Have you thought about, I mean, we're not a socialist economy, but there, the door is open um, through that kind of tax credit for a price signal for companies that are producing uh, with low carbon footprint, so. Yeah, I think um, 
it's hard sometimes for a really small company to take advantage of a, a tax credit, but I think there are opportunities to work with potentially bigger companies that, that can utilize that and that helps that collaboration happen. And honestly, like working with bigger companies is probably the fastest way to move technologies forward. Um, and I, I would say the same. Working <laughs> with smaller companies are the, are, are the fast way to move technologies forward. <laughs> so it, it enables, you know, potentially very profitable partnership. Um, and I think that's that's one way that 45Q can be really helpful for, for new innovations. Certainly existing um, large companies also probably helps with the internal um, development of that technology. And certainly we look at that when we're looking at new carbon sequestration projects. Uh, we have the, the, uh, the unit in Alberta because there was a, they signaled a, essentially a carbon price. And um, so there was support for that. Definitely that goes into our, our decision making process. And for those of you who are not aware of the, of the lingo here, 45Q is a federal tax credit that was expanded in uh, the beginning of, of this year and which gives a, a credit value of between 35 and $50 a ton, eventually using a, a quick ramp um, to CO2 that is securely stored in geologic formations or utilized. And the best news about it is that there is no cap on the amount of CO2, which was there Correct. previously. But you so need to begin so construction before January 1st of 2024. That's right. Yeah. Next question. Uh, good evening. This, uh, this was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Chad Olson. I'm with Seismic Energy Solutions. A little different industry. I work on efficiency in buildings, so trying to drive down that first pillar. Uh, I had a list of a lot of questions, but the biggest question that I couldn't qu get an answer from was, how do you take a gigaton level problem and bring it down to the average Joe so that they can understand what their impact is on carbon management at a personal level, but then to help implement a global solution? You know, I, I think that we need to look beyond the science and look at how the public deals with huge problems. I get emotional about this. We're at the beginning of a giant war. It's going to be incredibly painful. It's going to be incredibly bad for a lot of us. We're going to lose a Gulf city before the United States takes this seriously. And we need to look at that and say, how do we approach that situation? It's not a science problem. We need to, first of all, focus on our wins. Focus on the things that are going well. Focus on the companies that are spending a billion dollars to solve this and give them a pat on the back. But you know, we need to approach this not just as science, but as public advocacy and take our wins and, and celebrate them. Shell point of view? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I agree with what Roger said. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's very challenging um, because you need, you need to consider consumer choice uh, when you're looking at this. And, and how do you, I mean, it, it's, I find it always interesting in, in the U.S. because we don't really think about where our power comes from, where our fuel comes from, until it's not there anymore. Uh, I'm from one of those Gulf cities, New Orleans, and I was there for Hurricane Katrina. And when you don't have power and you don't have fuel, it really impacts your life. And, and that is, that's when you start thinking about where all of this is coming from and um, how, how to get that into into people's minds is it's very difficult to do. And from, from my perspective, if I can answer the, the question too, I think the, for common individuals, the biggest carbon impact that they have regards their transportation choices. So flying is usually number one. Um, road transport, usually number two, followed by diet. Um, how many children you have. So some of these things, as you can see, get pretty, pretty thorny. Um, I think that every individual should do their best, but uh, I'm not going to tell you that that individual action alone is going to change the world at the scale that we, we're looking at here. I think governments are going to need to play a major role, and the, in our societies, the biggest way in which we can get governments to act the way we want is through our voting choices. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Next question, please. Oh. <laughs> Charles Marion. So 
I notice that everybody right now is looking at the usual cycle of, of we look at California to provide a lot of leadership and such as it did on the solar and wind <coughs> energy, it went through a large period where it just made it profitable. If you got into the wind energy at the right time, you made a profit. If you were good at it, if you were better than everybody else, you made more profit. And this lasted for a golden period of five years or so and then started to ramp down and, and who's left are people who are actually making profit. And I know we want to see a, a set of subsidies for that. I'm actually curious if anyone's looking to make money a little farther west because Hawaii is a US state that has an extremely high cost for its fossil fuels. It has a direct impact in that anytime they have a climate problem, it, it's their number, it impacts their number one revenue. They have a transportation system where everybody turns over their cars or 80% of the cars are rentals that turn over in three years and have limited ranges or the poster children for electric cars. And they have such a surplus of electricity from solar during the day that their power companies are failing. On the, the grid doesn't know how to handle this and nobody's sure of a business model. So how would we make money off of Hawaii? How, how could we go to Hawaii and say, look, there's got to be a way to make money here because we can improve your tourism, we can cut your costs. How do we make money off Hawaii? Yeah, I guess uh, i comment on that a little bit. I think Hawaii itself is actually well aware also of, of the things you just mentioned, and they actually have accelerator programs to help connect new technologies to, you know, Hawaii markets. Um, and so and we've been part of that, and... I think there's lots of other technologies that they're trying to bring in to solve some of those kind of things that are problems for them, being far from you know a refinery where they can easily get um, petroleum, but then kind of are a market, uh, you know, a specialized market, an advantage for some of these new technologies to to come in and take over. Um, Well, maybe I say a little bit about that. Now, I think there are some things that you can test in Hawaii that'll relate to California. There's some things you cannot. It's a very different, we are interconnected grid. The grid will have, you know, so we just passed, uh, the, the governor just signed uh, SB 100, which is 100% carbon-free electricity by 2045. And then he also signed an executive order of 100% or zero net carbon of the whole economy by 2045, which is going to be enormously difficult. I think if you're trying to get to 60% renewable, which is one of the requirements of the, 24, the SB100, as you go beyond 50% energy over the year and you go to 70, 80, 85%, the challenges become more and more. And you have to take a, a whole systems view and figure out how to do dynamic demand response. Okay? You've got to figure out markets, pricing schemes, where when you have excess of electricity being generated in the middle of the day with solar, you give the incentives to people to charge their EVs at that time and not to charge the EVs in the evening when the sun is down. You've got to have other storage mechanisms the cheapest way to store electricity today is pumped hydro. We have 1,400 dams in California, but a permitting process in California is so horrendous that you can't get a permit to make a hydroelectric into a pumped hydro, just a retrofit. That costs but roughly $10, $10 to $20 a kilowatt hour, whereas today the lithium-ion battery costs $200. Lithium-ion battery is not going to cut it for multi-day storage and we're sitting on these hydroelectric. So this is something that along with that SB100, there needs to be some supporting policy to allow the grid to evolve that is affordable and reliable. Reliability is key. And a lot of the assets that we have on our grid, uh, the backup assets are for that reliability and for the peak, right? So we obviously have to shave off the peak with demand response, et cetera. 
But the other assets, how do we minimize the cost of that so that it, and it still make it reliable and stable? And those are the things that I, I don't think we have figured this out. We'll have to sort of, you know, evolve along with it and figure out the solutions. So and that have, solution for California is very different from Hawaii, by the way. I mean, I think you, you bring up a good point because every region or every state is, is going to have a different solution. I mean, the, the, there's potential for geothermal in Hawaii, which That's right. may not exist other places. And so how are they addressing that as well? So unfortunately, we're running out of time. We have time for one more question, maybe two, unless we make them extremely quick. Uh, my name is Eric Simon. I'm a documentary filmmaker. And I sense that there's a consensus among the panel that we need to do something more to make it more worthwhile for people to do what's good for the planet. And I'm just wondering if there are any ideas among you about something the California legislature could do that would make you happy. The California legislature is pretty proactive. Sometimes they go a little too far. I mean, 100% renewable would have been really difficult and 100% carbon free provides other options that will provide the low cost. Um, but I, you know, let, let me actually address, the, there was a question asked about what we should we do as people, and since a filmmaker. I think, I don't, I don't think we technical or scientific people have really explained to the common people what is it that in everything we touch on a daily basis, has some implications on energy. It has been, it's somewhat related to energy. Otherwise, if you take that energy away, our clothes, our, you know, our carpets, all of that kind of go away. And the implications of our choices, how when we use something has implications on carbon and our energy use, I think that explanation has not been, people have not connected the dots. And I think it's very important, as you as a filmmaker and others, to be able to explain to the common public oh, what is it that, what the, the choices that we make, how does it, what are the implications of that on our energy system, on our climate, et cetera, on our carbon emissions? And I, I really have hope for the next generation because you know, we get to meet them on a regular basis at Stanford and other universities, et cetera. And I think they are getting it much more but I think the connections of our choices to the implications on, on, on a climate is absolutely critical. I think that's the end. And that is the okay. end. Karen's coming up here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank our speakers. All of you for sharing your perspectives so candidly, George, for leading the conversation so very well. We have a small token of appreciation for you today. It is the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'll take it to Sally. It Sally has, a, I think you should keep it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. A recording of this program will be available on the Churchill Club YouTube channel shortly, where you will find recordings of most of our other programs as well. We do hope that you find that to be a useful resource. We also invite you to consider joining us for some of our upcoming programs. Uh, let's see, next week we have Urban Air Taxis on the 15th. On the 28th, we're going to look at massive collaboration for cybersecurity. And we also have a special exclusive program related to the San Jose Sharks for our hockey friends. So ask us about those if you're interested. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs>